So we're back in the space engine. Um, mostly because that fairly interesting news that came out in the last uh, day or so. A team over at Caltech has a, in theory, got um, some data that suggests there might be a hypothetical ninth planet in the outskirts of the solar system, um, which is interesting. Um, so I thought I'd pay a visit over here at Space Engine, just just have a look and get a general sense of the scales that we're looking at here. Uh, you may recognise this particular object as the Earth. Um, you may have seen it in numerous things like looking down or out the window. Um, it's a fairly nice planet. It's found precisely one Earth distance away from the Sun, one astronomical unit. Near enough. Wobbles in and out a bit. I can, in fact, see my house from here. Say hello. Um, and here's the sun. If you haven't noticed the sun, um, I really can only assume we've been living in a cave, or possibly Scotland. Um, right, so let's add some orbits in. We have the Earth's on its slightly wonky barycenter, which is inside it, but we still wobble around the, the um, in orbit a little. That purple line over there is a very distant binary system that is quite a long way apart, which is interesting, but not at all relevant to what I'm currently talking about. Um, a lot of arms, because I'm pretty much just doing a stream of consciousness regarding this planet, or planet, potential planet, hypothetical planet, maybe planet, whatever it is. But let's zoom out a bit. So the Earth is currently found at one AU, one astronomical unit, ish. Uh, one get distance from the Earth and the Sun, about 93 million miles, 186 million kilometers, or quite a long way, eight light minutes and 20 light seconds. Um, Yes, it's a bit, bit of a way out. So let's zoom out a bit further. There's Mars, about one and a half AU. There's Ceres. There's Jupiter, at five-ish. And can I keep going out? Now passing Saturn here, at about ten-ish. There's Uranus, at convenient enough, about twenty-ish. And here comes Neptune, which for some reason in this version of Space Engine is at some weird angle to the rest of the, the, rest of the solar system case in point. Not sure what's going on there. It should be at roughly the same angle as the rest, but that is at 30. 30 AU out. And you can notice there are a lot more asteroidy things puttering around out here. Uh, in the case of this, we have Homea, Make Make, Mac Mac, Mickey Mickey, whatever. That one, Make Make. Oh, Lou, it's the easiest way to pronounce it. There's Pluto and Sharon, or Charon, if you know how to pronounce it. And I think this one is Eris. Hello. Eris is at the moment one of the most distant things we know in the solar system. Well, that may have just changed. See, what they found is, and the team at Caltech includes, um, I believe, Dr. Mike Brown, the discoverer of Eris and Sedna, which we're, which we're about to come to. Unfortunately, Sedna doesn't appear normally, so I'm going to have to stop fluffing up the controls. Uh, and let's have a look in here. Sedna. Ah, oh, there's Sedna. Let's pay a visit, shall we? We don't actually know what Sedna looks like, beyond small and probably round, and reddish. Um, well, it's so far away that it's not really important to us right now. Except for this interesting discovery. And what they found is that Sedna and friends are beyond the scattered disk. Uh, what we've got is the Kuiper Belt exists around, just beyond uh, Neptune's orbit, its uh, asteroid belt. And it's gravitationally influenced by Neptune. Outside that, where we meet friends, people like Eris, friends like Eris, is the scattered disk. Which are things that have been punted out of the... Uh, out of... Neptune's influence somehow, and are now just sort of puttering around in little innocent orbits of their own, untouched by, as far as we're aware, anything. But there's also this third class of object out here, which are, which is the, um, I don't know, Sednoids now, because there's a few of them have been found, Sedna and friends, which are on these absolutely astoundingly huge orbits. Um, well, the thing is, even when, even when they get the closest they get to the sun, in this case, it's about 80 
astronomical units out. So 80 times the distance between the Earth and the between the Earth and the Sun. We can't even see the Earth's orbit in here; it's just lost in the glare. So even at this distance, oh, at this distance, it closely gets the Sun. It's far outside the um, effects of anything but the Sun, in theory. But, there's a few more objects out here, and they all seem to be coming in from roughly the same sort of angle. So they're all coming in from over on this side. And what uh, Dr. Brown thinks, or suspects, or theorizes, or hypothesizes, which is a very hard word to say, let me assure you, um, is that the reason everything's coming in from one direction is because they're a terrible band and they're trying to get away from it. Or, that something is stopping them, is influencing them and ensuring the orbits are only in stable in one direction. Right. Shout if you're not following me. Okay. So. Here we are at an absurd distance from the, from the Sun. And this is, this is Neptune's orbit still, which is a 30 astronomical units. The theory is, this new object comes to the uh, as perihelion comes close to the Sun at about 200 astronomical units. So it would be somewhere at closest uh, that's 30, call this 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, many. It'll be somewhere over here the closer it gets. Roughly. Hopefully, you can see my mouse pointer. If not, it's uh, pretty much under the text box over here on the left. So that's quite a long way out. Um, and that's interesting for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it means it's very hard to spot, although there, are, there have been deep sky surveys running for quite some time, excuse my stutter, having deep sky surveys running for years and years and years are uh, pretty well tuned at finding this sort of thing. Now you'd like to think that something that's uh, theorised to be about slightly small than Neptune, so Uranus sized-ish, um, you'd hope that that would show up on one of these. On the other hand, at closest it comes this close. Now furthest, oh wow, we're all the way out here somewhere, in theory. Uh, and I'll be the first to say, there's not a lot of data, and if it was close, we'd think it would be easier to spot, unless it's in the way of the Milky Way, which is entirely possible, because it's kind of hard to spot things against this background of every single star. Yeah, you're not going to spot much over there, eh? But, here's the thing. It could be out there. And it's an orbit that long, and not that wide. Um, it's going to take a very, very long time to go around. And if it's out to the edge, which after reading the uh, the abstract apparently it is, or it may well be if it hasn't been found in the others, um, it can be very hard to spot. Very, very hard to spot. But, again, theoretically, quite possible. Now what's... Uh, again, I'll be the first one. There's not a lot of actual solid, uh, and there's no physical evidence. It's there. It's it, there's, at the moment. It's a scientific theory. Um, the model is we have all of these setnoids coming in from one direction. Why is that? Data seems to fit the fact, or it seems to work. There is a large object out there preventing them from coming from other angles and would explain why they seem to be relatively constrained into a certain area of uh, the sky. But, the really interesting thing, and I've said this a lot of times, I'm probably repeating myself a lot in this stream of deranged consciousness, the interesting thing here is it also ties in um, to the Nice model, which is an interesting model, because it's the model of how the solar system formed. And Think on the Nice model, I'm going to zoom in onto a planet here, so you can at least look at pretty things while I, while I babble. Uh, I think on the Nice model, is it? Again, it models how the system formed out of uh, protoplanetary nebula. Or just beyond that, how the planets formed and how they got to where they are. And f for quite some time, 
it didn't seem to work very well. Um, you can get it to work, it's just that it's not perfect. Unsurprisingly, it's a model. But it became ten times more likely to work in a given run if you add another... if you added in the initial star system of the initial star system another gas giant, another Neptune-like ice giant, rather. And if you assume when you start that the solar system goes uh, the usual chaff in the middle, um, Jupiter, Saturn, Mystery Planet, Neptune, Uranus, and it's all a bit more compact than it is now, so everyone's sort of inside about Uranus's orbit. What happens is, at a certain point, Jupiter and Saturn start to resonate. So for every one orbit Saturn does, Jupiter does too. And I think to remember is both Jupiter and Saturn are horrendously massive. Jupiter is 312 Earths in in mass. Saturn is 92 odd. Or is it 318? It's whatever it is, it's 300 and something. It's lots. Uh, well, one Jupiter is it's four fleet told us. Um, so basically, Saturn is about a third, quarter of the mass of Jupiter, and it's still more massive than everything else in the solar system, apart from the Sun put together and Jupiter put together. Uh, it would still outweigh them. So the effect of these things now resonating is utterly horrendous on the solar system. Let's put it this way. Um, Neptune was discovered by Leverrier and uh, partially by Adams uh, using the maths, because Uranus wasn't where it was supposed to be. It was being gravitationally perturbed by, um, by the presence of Neptune. And Neptune isn't very heavy, and it's a really long way away. Uh, unfortunately, Saturn and Jupiter are now resonating, so, and they're all everything's close together. And that means that every 10, 20 years, or 10, 30, or 15, 30 years, there is basically a thump of tidal forces throughout the solar system. And that causes orbits to go a bit squiffy, technically speaking. So, what happens is, all the way out there, our mystery planet is basically catapulted out of the solar system into the deep dark depths. Uranus is shunted outwards. Utter chaos in the inner system because there's asteroids and things going everywhere. Um, Neptune is punched out past Uranus as it overtakes it and ends up in its current orbit, slamming into the Kuiper Belt as it was at the time, scattering everything there, hurling a lot of things inwards possibly creating what we call the uh, late, heavy late heavy bombardment, as in everything, the reason why everything is so cratered is a whole lot of meteors, asteroids, meteorites, all came past and slammed into everything uh, a few million years after system formed, which is nice. Um, and there's sort of trace evidence for this sort of thing actually happening, and we're going to have a pay visit to Neptune here to have a look. Say hello to Neptune. Neptune's moons, oops, are kind of interesting. It has a couple of sets of them. This widely scattered outer set has the widest outer set of moons of any planet. Nereid here, which is on a weird orbit, as you can see. Triton, and oops, excuse me, I just slam into a gas giant, that can't be good for my insurance. And the inner moons here, along with its assorted rings. Now, all of these inner moons, except for I think, except for Proteus here, are doomed. And they are also basically made of rubble. Uh, so they're all being pulled in, because they're, they're orbiting Neptune faster than it, than it orbits, so they're being pulled in. Proteus is also doomed, even though it's outside the, that radius, because of this thing. Triton is an odd moon by certain standards. It orbits Neptune the wrong way, at a strange angle. Most things orbit in the plane of um, the equator of the thing they're orbiting. Neptune does, uh, Triton doesn't. 
So it looks suspiciously like Triton is an interloper, something that snuck in and gatecrashed the party. Probably because it, um, probably when Neptune sailed out to the Kuiper Belt. It also looks suspiciously like Pluto, which is, in fact, it's slightly larger than Pluto. So it all kind of ties in with the fact that something, everything got shunted around quite horrendously, as does the fact that Uranus is, of course, tipped over on its side infamously. So the, what this means for this, this is what makes this Hypothetical Planet 9 interesting for me, is the fact that it actually ties in to this, again, equally a theory, equally hypotheticals, potentials, etc, etc, etc. But it ties in, and it ties in neatly and nicely, and I think there's some potential here. I would. I think it's going to be quite an interesting few years. I mean, it's important to note that the, uh, the team of... Uh, like Brown haven't said it's certain, they just said it's this is our theory. Um, I think it's something like three and a half sigma uh, standard discovery in the terms of uh, actually having an actual discovery, you can call it a six sigma, so there's a very little chance of it being a mistake. This is three and a bit, which still means it's like 90 something percent certain. Um, but what they have said is basically there's enough evidence here to make us think this is probably worth looking into. And I think the next couple of years are going to be quite interesting in that respect. Because, yeah, there's been lots of Planet X theories in the past, um, most of them insane. Some admittedly well-meaning people, Cl uh, Clyde Tombo, discovered Pluto, and was convinced that was it. There's some people who, are, who think it's, you know, the Death Star hurling asteroids and things into the solar system. Uh, not convinced by that, but the fact there's the fact there may be something out there is well within the realms of possibility. I mean, I, I like I like the idea. I mean, it makes more sense than the brown dwarf puttering around even further out, which you think would have popped up in an infrared survey. But we keep spotting nearby nearby brown dwarfs, so who knows? I think we are in for an interesting few years, as I've said on at least two occasions already. Well, that's just that's just some random thoughts on this subject. Um, feel free to shout. I and this it's, it's going to be interesting, whatever happens. Um, yeah, that's me. Have fun. Enjoy space. <laughs>